Uh, so this is a, a course. Uh, so the title of this course that was given is Frobenius distributions. I hope that's suitably large. Um, Um, I'm, I'm also going to refer to the use of term Sato Tate distributions because uh, this is the title of a lecture series that uh, my uh, partner in crime, Drew Sutherland, who will be here later today, uh, used for a lecture series at the 2016 Arizona Winter School. We're going to be following those lectures in these lectures. So, the Arizona Winter School, I should just say if you haven't heard of it, um, this is the website for it. It's a uh, a conference for graduate students that takes place every spring, uh, or well, I guess late winter, at the uh, University of Arizona. Um, it's possibly the biggest and longest running and most successful instructional conference for graduate students in number theory. Um, it's always on an interesting topic. This coming spring, it'll be uh, abelian varieties. Um, and most of the past year's lecture notes and videos are posted on the website. So um, these lecture notes are, are available there, although they're also on the archive and they're also actually uh, published uh, because there was a proceedings from, the, from that particular year. So we'll be following that series of lectures, uh, on, which is called Sato Tate distributions, but these two terms will be roughly interchangeable. I won't give you a formal definition of either of them just yet, but as we go along, um, I'll illustrate them both, as will Drew. Uh, so what I want to do is start out with an example. So this lecture will mostly be about the following situation, although at the end I'll uh, connect it to, uh, to another situation that we'd also like to incorporate, and the remainder of the lectures will be about developing a framework that, that captures both of them. Uh, so I'm going to copy, since this screen will go away eventually, I'm going to copy some of this down. So let f be a polynomial with integer coefficients, um, just square free of some degree d. And I'll be interested in the following thing. For p a prime, I'm going to define nf of p to be the number of values of x in fp for which f of x equals 0 as an element of fp. So of course, that's somewhere between 0 and p. But in fact, uh, I can do better than that. I can say for as p gets larger, uh, this becomes a better estimate. There, are, there are, can be at most as many roots as the degree of the polynomial. So this is bounded independently of p. And uh, it's kind of a classic issue in, in, in elementary number theory, which then becomes an issue in algebraic number theory because of the tools we use to study it, to understand if you fix f, how does this vary with p? And there are a few examples that uh, are quite easy to analyze. For example, if f is a quadratic polynomial, then you can complete the square and use quadratic reciprocity to give an expression for this that depends on p modulo some other quantity. Uh, and uh, there are some other cases where that happens, which I'll come back to in a moment. But if I take, for example, x cubed minus x plus 1, uh, if, you, if you compute a few examples, uh, you don't see any obvious structure. So in particular, you don't see any pattern uh, that is determined by the reduction of p modulo some fixed positive integer. Uh, you can uh, try a couple of examples in your head. You can see, well, there's no, it's not uh, a function of p mod 3 or p mod 5 or p mod 4, anything like that. Uh, so as you stare at the data, you see a couple of things. Uh, you don't see two very often. Uh, there's a good reason for that. If it's a polynomial of degree 3, um, for it to have exactly two rational roots means that, well, with multiplicity, it has three rational roots of fp, and one of them has to be repeated. And repeated roots can't occur very often 
because a repeated root would imply that P divides the discriminant of the polynomial, which is some, because this is square free, that's some non-zero integer. So only finitely many primes could fall into that category. So in this case, the, the discriminant is minus 23, so there's exactly one prime where you see the two, and everywhere else you're, you, you're, only, can, you're only able to see zero, one, and three, uh, and you see a bunch of zeros and ones, eventually you get to a three, it takes a while, um, but if you, went, if you went further, you would see more and more of all of these things, and uh, in particular, if you go a lot further, uh, you could compute a table of, you know, for various values of b, you can take all the primes up to b and sort them into these categories as to whether uh, not nfp equals 0, 1, 2, or 3, uh, and you see these results. Of course, the, the value for c2 is trailing off to 0 quite rapidly because there's only one prime in the data set that does that, uh, and as we go on, the other values seem to be stabilizing at particular uh, values. So the first one seems to be stabilizing at one-third. C0 seems to be stabilizing at one-third. C1 seems to be stabilizing at one-half. And C3 seems to be stabilizing at one-sixth. Uh, and so there's, in fact, going to be a theorem that explains this. Uh, so yeah, so that's what we're expecting. C0 is a third, C1 is a half, and C3 is a sixth. Um, and so in fact, there, this is uh, a general phenomenon. Uh, but in order to explain this, let, I'm gonna need some more board space, so let me switch this around so I'm no longer projecting. And now we'll start talking about why, so, so the claim is that, is that I, I can, I can describe the limiting values of, let me take the notation from here, so I'm going to write ci of b, which is the well, it's the, it's the proportions of primes up to b such that n f of p is equal to i. Okay, so, uh, so it's the, sort of a density, so the denominator is all the primes up to my cutoff, and then I count in the numerator the ones for which n f p is equal to i, and uh, And the claim is that I can describe these things, and in fact, they will be rational numbers. These limits will exist. They will be rational numbers, and I can predict what they are in some, in some sensible way. Now, what is that way? Well, that's the next thing I want to talk about next. So the recipe for, for this comes from a little Galois theory uh, of a sort we've, we've seen earlier in the morning. So... What am I going to do? So let L be the splitting field of F, which I could think of as being generated over Q by alpha 1 through alpha D, where uh, F factorizes over Q bar as X minus alpha 1 through X minus alpha D. So I join all the roots of the polynomial. This is a Galois extension. So I'm going to write G for its Galois group. And this is not an abstract group. Uh, I mean, it is an abstract group, but it comes with more structure because it comes with uh, a fixed permutation action on the set of roots. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really a... A, a permutation group. It's a group embedded into the symmetric group on D symbols. Uh, and, well, for the purposes of what I'm going to say right now, it's enough to think about this permutation representation, but to set myself up for later, 
Uh, I want to also give you another way to think about this. So I'm going to write rho for the associated linear representation. So I'm going to take g and map it to gld of, let's say, c, although any field of characteristic 0 would be good enough for the moment. So to go from a permutation representation to a linear representation, well, I just uh, think of, uh, if you like, I take you know, each element of G and map it to a permutation matrix according to how it permutes these things. Okay, and I claim the, the nature of these values NFP is uh, somehow controlled by this representation. Namely, it's controlled by the images of special elements of G. So what are those elements? Well, they are the Frobenius elements that we've seen earlier. So so I have an exact sequence. Uh, so what do I do is I pick a prime ideal P of OL above the rational prime ideal generated by P, and then I have uh, DP underscore, which is the decomposition group. It's, that's probably not big enough. So I have the decomposition group, which is the stabilizer of the action of G on the set of all these prime ideals above ordinary P. Right? There's a trans this is a transitive action. There are only finitely many of these primes above rational P, and they're permuted transitively. So if I take the stabilizer of one of them, I get the decomposition group. It turns out that surjects onto the Galois group of the residue field extension. So the residue field uh, OL mod P, and that's a Gal finite Galois extension of FP. And the kernel is called the inertia group. But for the purposes of the kind of problems I'm going to be talking about, like taking these limits, well, this limit is going to be insensitive to any uh, fu fussing around at finitely many primes. So in particular, I can forget all the ramified primes. There are only finitely many of them. And so uh, I, can, uh, I can concentrate on the case where P does not ramify. If P does not ramify, then IP is the trivial group. And then what happens? Well, I have this finite extension of finite fields. So this has a canonical generator, namely the map that raises every element of the larger finite field to the pth power. And so I take this generator. And I lift it to here, but if I'm in the case where, so in general, the thing that I'm going to call fra p is some lift of this generator, which will be well-defined modular inertia, but if p does not ramify, then there is no inertia, and so I really have a well-defined element fra p underscore. Um, it's well-defined not in terms of p, but in terms of p underscore. So it depends on the choice of the prime above, but, um, What happens if I vary uh, the prime above? Well, I have this transitive action on these primes above p. So if I you know, move around in the orbit, then the decomposition group gets conjugated. Um, and this element will therefore also get conjugated. So as p underscore varies over ordinary p, 
this fraud P traces out a conjugacy class. G. So, so I don't really want to think about the p underscore because the, the original question I'm asking about has nothing to do with p underscore. Um, it's about p. So the choice of, of p underscore will get washed out if I only think about Frobenius p as defining a conjugacy class rather than an, an individual element. OK, so now what is the connection? The connection to this original question is that, well, NFP counts uh, you know, fixed points again, assuming for P unramified, NFP counts fixed points of fraud P acting on the set of roots, which in terms of the linear representation means that NFP is the trace of, oh, I should call this rho sub f, but I'm not going to, and I'm just going to call it rho, uh, evaluated at frob p. Right? The, the, fi the number of fixed points of a, of a permutation is just the trace of the associated permutation matrix because if you just get ones on the diagonal where you have fixed points and you get zeros everywhere else. So, so NFP is determined by, so it, it depends solely on which uh, conjugacy class is represented by this element here. Notice the right hand side also only depends on this thing up to conjugation which consistently with the fact that the left-hand side does not depend on the choice of p underscore, just on ordinary p. Great. And so now you can apply the, I'm going to be careful about the spelling here, because uh, I have a, I've decided to switch from the transliteration from Russian to the transliteration from Ukrainian, because this is ultimately the Ukrainian name, the Chebotaryov density theorem. And that tells me, what does it tell me? It tells me that these Frobenius elements are, roughly speaking, equidistributed in G. Now, of course, the, these elements are not well-defined. They're only well-defined up to conjugation. So, so, so the conjugacy class class of frob P is uniformly distributed in the set of conjugacy classes of G, but not for the kind of uniform measure on this set, but for the, the measure which weights each class Uh, proportionally to 1 over its size. So, um, sorry, uh, proportionally to its, sorry, I want it proportional to its size. So, so in other words, if this thing was a well-defined element, then, it, then I, should, I could think of it as being uniformly distributed in G, but it isn't a well-defined element, so I have to kind of glom together each conjugacy class. But each conjugacy class remembers how big it is and contributes proportionally uh, to, the, to the distribution. So what does this mean concretely? So EG, for my example, which was, what was it, x cubed minus x plus 1. So this is a case where g is the full group S3. 
And so uh, so now I can uh, reconstruct the numbers that I had on earlier. So for i equals 0, well, what I have to do is ask myself, well, how many elements of S3 have 0 fixed points? Well, it's the two 3 cycles. So that's 2 out of 6. I'll leave it unreduced for clarity. For i equals 1, uh, there are the three transpositions. So I get 3 out of 6. And for i equals 3, I get the identity element alone. So I get 1 out of 6, which sort of ex helps explain why it took until p equals 59 to see the first example of i equals 3 is because it's a rare phenomenon compared to the others. So the statistics of this problem are dictated by the structure um, of kind of random elements of this particular finite group. Now, maybe aside, if G happens to be abelian, then uh, that's, the, that's the situation where you actually see structure that depends on a modulus. So we saw the Kronecker Weber Hilbert theorem earlier, which says that if G is abelian, then this splitting field is contained in some cyclotomic field, Q zeta n for some n. And then uh, FROB P is determined by the residue class of P mod n via Arden reciprocity. I mean, in this case, it's elementary. Um, I mean, once you know this, then it's, then it's elementary because you can work out explicitly what Frobenius is doing. Um, let's write P mod n. So uh, if G is abelian, you get a very explicit expression similar to the one you would get for quadratic fields, which of course always are abelian. But uh, starting with this kind of example, you get some irregular behavior, but the statistics of it are still something you can read off. And so that's the theme we're going to carry forward is when we kind of replace this with something more sophisticated along the same lines, we won't be able to say too much concrete about the individual NFPs, at least with the, with the kind of tools we're using. Um, of course, if you, if you think more holistically about things like modular forms, maybe you could say something, but uh, at some course level, we won't be, any, be able to say anything precise about how P converts to NFP, but uh, questions on average we can analyze using some group theoretic construction. Okay. Pause this. Let me pause to see if there are any questions at this point. Okay. Great. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm now going to do a few things that, that kind of take this relatively simple situation and make it a little more complicated uh, in ways that might seem needless at the moment, but will help me later. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I want to say reformulate the way I talk about finite groups. So G is a finite group, but I also want to think of it as a discrete topological group. Meaning, I think of it as a topological space for the discrete topology. For the discrete topology, the group operation is automatically continuous. So, OK, it is a topological group if I give it the discrete topology. Uh, now, why would I do that? Well, uh, later on, I want to talk about some groups that are not discrete. Um, but they will be compact. So because G is finite, it, it, as, a, as a topological space with the discrete topology, it's compact. 
Uh, and some of the things we know about finite groups generalize to compact topological groups. Um, change out of chalk here. Wait, that's too stubby. Any compact topological group. has a unique uh, left and right invariant tra translation invariant measure which is called Haar measure the person who first wrote it down so uh, Yes, uh, probability measure. Yes, I want the total measure to be one. Yeah, since I'm thinking about compact things, th th then there's no problem with the normalization. Uh, if you think about locally compact topological groups, then this is a little more subtle um, because there's not a natural normalization. It's also left and the left and right translation invariant measures might not. Uh, you have to worry about the difference between left and right translation invariant, but I'm only going to be talking about compact topological groups in these lectures. So it is the case that a compact topological group has uh, a left and right translation invariant measure. For a finite group, this is, of course, just the uniform measure. Um, but uh, we'll see by the end of this lecture an example uh, which is not a finite group that I'm super interested in. And this induces, well, let me, look, before I, I say this, how do I want to think about measures? Well, I'm going to think of them, I'm going to think of this as a, as a Radon measure. So I'm going to, let's say, in the, I'm only going to use the kind of Radon version of this. So it's going to give me a function, a functional on say, if I have a continuous function g on, on, the group, on the group, then I could compute the, uh, let's call this thing mu g. So if mu g is the invariant measure, then I can integrate this measure against some continuous function and get some real number out. Um, and it is a probability measure. If I, if I take the constant function 1 and integrate, I get back 1. Uh, so so you, get, you actually get more than that. But I'm only going to use the, uh, the, I'm only going to integrate against continuous functions. So So then I could take the push forward measure on the space of conjugacy classes. So if I take the space of conjugacy classes of G, that will again be compact. Um, it no longer has a group structure, but uh, I can still take the measure. And all that means is. Well, the functional that I just wrote down, instead of uh, evaluating an arbitrary functions on G, I just evaluated on class functions, functions that are invariant under conjugation. Uh, and that tells me how, what the push forward measure is. So, uh, and if you notice, what I did before is exactly this. I took the uniform measure on G, and then the, the distribution I wanted to use on the conjugacy classes um, was the, is the push forward measure in this sense. So, uh, so for example, we'll see this example a little bit later. You know, you could take, if you want to take some non-compact group, you could do something like SU2. That's a the two by two unitary matrices with determinant one, uh, right? So this is,
So these are two by two invertible matrices such that uh, the determinant is one, that's this S part, and the U part is, uh, oh my gosh, can I write down the definition of unitary? Uh, the inverse, what is it? It's uh, the star, that, do I need to transpose somewhere? Or the star, or is the star, or does the star already have the transpose in it? Yeah. Anyway. So I take two by two unitary matrices with determinant one. That's a compact uh, topological group. Uh, what can I say about its conjugacy classes? Well, the class of one of these things, since I've determined, uh, fixed the determinant, um, I have two eigenvalues, uh, this, is, this is compact, so everything is diagonalizable. I get two eigenvalues which multiply to one, and uh, they have to be conjugates of each other So by, by the unitary condition. So you, know, you have a pair of complex numbers on the unit circle. Um, well, you might as well add them together, and that's a complete, that turns out to be a complete invariant. So the space of conjugacy classes is isomorphic via the trace, the map here is trace, is isomorphic via the trace map to the interval minus two plus two. And so um, you, can you can ask what is the, the Haar measure, uh, what does the Haar measure induce on this? We'll, we'll, we'll see it later. Um, it will show up in a, in a very natural example. But, uh, but, but the point is that this, that for the moment, the point is that this is a construction that makes sense for an arbitrary compact topological group. I mean, you might not have this interpretation in general. The space of conjugacy classes might be something more involved. But whatever that is, you have some measure on it that comes from the, the Haar measure on G. And that's what we were using here. And in later lectures, We'll, we'll, we'll start to see pictures emerge where we have representations that are not uh, quite, of, that are not, uh, of Galois groups that are not quite of this type, but I won't say too much about them until after we've had the talk this afternoon. So we'll put those in some context. In the meantime, let me do so. So that's one way in which I want to upgrade our, our previous discussion without yet any payoff, but, but to kind of uh, expand our mindset a little bit to not fo fixate on the fact that G is finite. We want to think about G as being a, a compact topological group uh, and formulate this, this equidistribution statement in that language. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do in order to get away from thinking too much about finite groups is uh, to think more like a statistician, right? This is a school on arithmetic statistics. So, and we're asking a kind of statistical question here. So, uh, so how would a statistician go about the question of, well, if I have some unknown distribution, um, how do I uh, make, sort of, get, get my hands on it? Well, one way to do it is to use what are called moments. So if I have some, so let's say I have some X is some, some random measure, and I want to so I have some X is, let's say X is some uh, probability space. And T is some real valued uh, random variable. That just means some function. Uh, the moments, the moment sequence of T is the following, well, you take the expectation of t to the n for all n, where t to the 0 is interpreted to be 1. So you start with a 1. The 0th moment is always 1. But then you take the expected value of t, the expected value of t squared, and so on. And this sort of captures. Uh, this captures some important information. So for example, if x itself is contained in the real line and t is just the embedding, 
then uh, when in reasonable situations, you can recover the distribution from this sequence. So this will th this potentially captures a lot of information. Um, if X is you know sits inside R n, you need uh, you know you need to somehow capture more than one direction. But the example we're going to see later, I mean, in the examples we're thinking of already, these are finite sets, so you could kind of take some function. Um, that embeds that finite set into R and then apply the thing I said. But, uh, but more to the point is I wanted what I, I'm going to be interested in the situation where I take the, the trace or uh, yeah, the, the, the trace of, of, of rho and use that as my function and, and take the moment sequence for that. Um, let me not say more. I could say various other things. So maybe I'll make some comments that I won't expand on too much just yet. So there's some additional comments that I want to make before I uh, switch, shift gears and, and talk about a higher dimensional situation is I can also, I also can look at uh, so I can also look at what I might call NFP to the K, which is the number of values of F not in of X not in FP, but in the degree K extension of it. And so for fixed P, I can package these numbers into something called the local zeta function, which we'll see, I think, more in the later lectures. But I, wanted, I won't say too much about it at the moment. Um, I mean, this, get, this, get, this sort of picks up more information. And you can kind of imagine uh, what's going to happen. Right, the way, the, the way you're able to say something about this guy is that, well, you do the analogous thing, except now I want to count fixed points not of Frobenius, but of its kth power. So I take Frob p underscore, take its kth power, plus, uh, push that through the representation, and take the trace of that. Um, and so, if I really want to get a hold of this representation, um, you know, if I want if I want to somehow try to characterize this representation, uh, it's not going to be enough to, to characterize. Uh, well, if I want to, yeah, if I want to under, for, say for an individual prime p, there's potentially more information available uh, if I keep track of these numbers and not just the NFPs, because for instance, if I take k as far as uh, a d, then like if I take d, the first the traces of the first d powers of some matrix, then I can recover its whole characteristic polynomial. Whereas I can't do that from just the first trace. So, uh, so keeping track of, of these things for higher values of d potentially gives me information about not just traces but the whole characteristic polynomials um, of these matrices. Okay. All right, I think I have 10, nine, 10 minutes or so. So let me switch to another example. So, so, so far I've only been talking about the zero dimensional situation, but this was really just the warm up for the situation we mostly want to be talking about through the rest of this series, which is the following situation. So now, suppose let x be a scheme of finite type over the integers. And for each prime p, I'm going to define nxp as the number of 
Well, I just take fp valued points of the scheme x and I count those. Okay, so this notation comes from Sarah's book, Lectures on NXP, which I think was suggested as, as a recommended reading associated to these lectures. Um, so, you know, you, you can ask, well, how does this depend on p? Uh, this is a slightly harder question to formulate because this is not going to be a priori bounded. Uh, this will, so the, in, in, in the case I'm going to be interested in, uh, it won't be bounded, so I'll have to use a different point of view to get a meaningful question. So here's the example I want to take. I want to take E to be the subscheme of P2 over the integers cut out by, well, let me write an affine equation. Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B. So if you really want to do this in projective coordinates, I should do something like Y squared Z equals X cubed plus AX Z squared plus B Z cubed. But I want you to see the, the Weierstrass form of an elliptic curve. So over Q, this is defining an elliptic curve, right? A and B are integers. Uh, I need to assume uh, this polynomial is square free. So generically, I'm getting an elliptic curve over Q. So the base chain from e, of E from Z to Q is an elliptic curve, say taking the, the point at infinity as the origin. And I also need to assume that this, this, the resulting elliptic curve does not have complex multiplication, which we haven't encountered the definition of yet, but I think is coming later in the week. But for the moment, just, the e, just think EQ has to be sufficiently generic. OK, so then what do I know about NEP So if you imagine uh, right the X map defines a map from this thing to P1 uh, and so P1 has you know over over any finite field it has you know order of the finite field plus one many points each of those has at most two preimages uh, usually it has zero or two, depending on whether or not the right-hand side evaluates to a quadratic residue. That's sort of a coin flip. So if you imagine the central limit theorem, it would suggest that I should write the number of FP points of this scheme as P plus one minus TP. Um, and then this thing should somehow be related to square root of p. Uh, at least if I avoid bad prime. So I want to assume that the reduction of the base change of e to fp is smooth. Um, so you'd expect that tp can't get too much longer, larger than some constant times square root of p. But in fact, in absolute value, it's bounded by two times root p on the nose. Uh, this was, uh, I get, I, if I remember correctly, this was maybe conjectured by Artin by analogy with the, with the Riemann hypothesis. So this is sort of the first case of the, the first non-trivial case of the Riemann hypothesis for function fields. Um, so this suggests Uh, looking at the ratio tp divided by root p in the interval minus 2 to plus 2. And, oh, actually, I should, I should get the projector warming up first. So I want to show you what happens when you 
actually look at this in an example. Now, these are just real numbers, so it's not clear uh, exactly what you should be doing in order to, to look at the distribution of this thing. Um, this world of moments and so on is going to tell us what to do, but before we get to that, which I might not do this hour, let me just show you the answer. And if I had been smart, I would have queued this up beforehand because now I have to type a URL on a French keyboard. Oh, where's the tilde? Somebody tell me where the tilde is on a French keyboard on an Azerty. Uh, yeah, I just, where do you type the tilde? <laughs> Uh, it's a French keyboard, as usual. Um, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's close enough. That'll get there. Okay. Oh, Zerti. Well, let's see. Do I have it's where's the link is? Oh, here it is. Yeah. So here's. I can probably make this bigger if I. I'll think about it carefully. Uh, plus, oh, apparently I don't, it's not clear how to make this bigger. But anyway, so you can do this numerical experiment of pick some, CM, some non-CM elliptic curve. Uh, this is the Elke's rank 28 example. Um, and you do a histogram plot. So you kind of, you, I think the way you normalize this is you take sort of the square root of the number of data points and use that as the number of bins for your histogram. And then you throw balls into bins. Uh, and then you see a shape emerging. And you also see moments, right? These are, uh, since I have a single real number here, I can take the moment sequence um, for, for this random variable. And you notice that it's converging to not just integers, but a familiar looking sequence of integers. 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, 42 should be familiar as the first, the, well, if you ignore the zeros, it's the first few Catalan numbers. And so the theorem that explains this is that, uh, yeah, oh, I'm just going to write it here. The, um, the values. Tp over root p are equidistributed for the push forward of horror measure on, well, what you do is you take the conjugacy classes of SU2, you use that isomorphism with my, the interval minus 2, 2 that I gave you earlier. And you, so you take this push forward measure. This push forward measure, it turns out, um, is given by the Lebesgue measure times the semicircular distribution function. And the moments of that sequence, one can show, uh, this probably goes back to Hermann Weyl, um, that this moment sequence is the Catalan numbers. And uh, that sort of at least explains um, the shape of the picture. It's not just some random distribution. Uh, it's, it's some group theoretic distribution. Uh, it doesn't depend on E, other than the fact that E does not have complex multiplication. There's a different picture you get uh, in the CM case. And so the goal of the remaining lectures is to put the thing we started with and this picture that I'm showing you at the end into some common framework that will at least uh, indicate what, what's needed to prove a theorem like this. There's actually quite a lot of hard input into this theorem, which we won't be able to talk about in, in much detail. But we can give you some overview of what's needed in order to prove theorems like this or make corresponding conjectures uh, for other schemes. So uh, maybe that's a good place to stop.